Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Underground. This is the briefing for Wednesday, the 18th of November, and as always, it is being recorded the day prior on the 17th of November. So let's get right to it, because we've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. But first, uh, kind of a quick heads up, uh, we've noticed that based on a lot of the DMs and emails that we've gotten, that a shocking number of people don't actually check out the description box on these videos. And we tend to put a lot of information down there. Uh, we have chapters. If you don't want to hear me ramble on about a specific topic, you can just click to the section you want to hear. Uh, we've also started to include lots of other information and any corrections that we have uh, once this video goes out, because obviously we can't edit this video once it goes out, so it's going to stay on the internet forever. And uh, the only way that we can kind of make slight changes is in the description box, right? We're certainly not perfect, so if there are any little minor mistakes, we will correct them there. And finally, we also have links to other stuff as well, like our website. Uh, the number of people who email us and say that the link doesn't work is kind of astounding because they either don't read the, the line literally right above it, which is that the link requires the Tor browser to work, or that people don't realize that YouTube shortens links, so you have to right-click on the link, save it, and then drop it in your Tor browser. And then once you do that, you're good to go. Um, so just a little heads up on that. Uh, we also have other stuff like our reading list and other things like that, so if you're looking for books to read or if you're trying to get into the field of intelligence analysis yourself, we have several reading lists that will help you get started. And finally, kind of a short announcement, we just created another YouTube channel for our War Kitchen content. So if you like those kinds of videos that we put out on that, um, <laughs> stay tuned because we've got a lot coming out. Uh, that's going to be on the other channel. I haven't, we haven't decided if we wanted to do dual posting over here on this channel and the other channel just yet. Uh, we may at first, I don't really know just yet because uh, the War Kitchen, as, a, as anybody knows, a, a new YouTube channel has a hard time getting started. And even if you were, as of right now, I literally just tried to search for the War Kitchen in YouTube and it's not even coming up, uh, even though it already has several thousand subscribers. Um, so YouTube doesn't like new channels, so we might have to see how that goes. Uh, but I just wanted to let everybody know that we've started this new channel because the War Kitchen stuff is just different enough from the actual like Intel stuff we do that it kind of warrants its own thing. So that's what we did. So let's get right into this with the weather. Winter is definitely upon us for, at least for ISR weather concerns, uh, for most of the country with really uh, heavy with cloud cover and things like that. So if you lots of different... Uh, aviation concerns for any kind of aerial uh, operations and also right now we are, we are in a green illumination cycle so it's going to be a really full moon 90 97 percent uh, illumination going to be a really bright moon and also the moon's going to start rising a little bit earlier in the night so at least for today for the next 12 hours the moon's going to be rising in the afternoon at 4:35 p.m and continue to grow and get above the horizon and get really bright as the night goes on and for winds for the next 18 hours, as you can see, pretty powerful winds up in the northern regions uh, as that winter weather starts to creep in. And like I mentioned, mostly the eastern U.S. is going to have most of the warnings and things like that moving forward for the next couple of days. Moving into no TAMs, really there are only two of note. Of course, they're both presidential this time around. Uh, the first one being the standard vacation no TAM at uh, over Biden's house in Wilmington, Delaware. And also, uh, Biden is planning to go uh, to Detroit, Michigan. Actually, as of the recording of this, uh, he should already be there. So uh, by the time this video goes out, this no TAM will, of course, expire on the 18th. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to point that out for anyone interested. As far as civil unrest goes, really the flavor of the week is, of course, the issue that everyone's talking about, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. So I'm not going to delve too much into the trial itself, but as of the recording of this, there has not been a verdict. Um, so really everybody's just kind of on pins and needles waiting to see what happens. Uh, a few people are saying that it's there's going to be violence no matter what because there have already been decently violent uh, demonstrations so far and the trial wasn't even over yet. Uh, and also a lot of very famous people with a lot of uh, influence on social media uh, have been encouraging violence in the local area, as well as other major U.S. cities. It's not just Kenosha uh, that's, that's a huge problem or, or the, where the threat exists. So, so far, uh, really, uh, we haven't done the analytical legwork to kind of figure out what the threat assessment for this is because it's just really unknown. We've got winter weather creeping in, and usually colder weather prohibits people from... 
demonstrating slash rioting slash looting, um, but that will almost certainly occur on some level, no matter what happens. Uh, the National Guard has already been activated, as I'll as I'll mention here in a bit. Uh, for this, but again, they're not really being staged in any productive manner, at least from what we can see for right now. Um, and it's really just kind of wait and see mode and see how see how the rioting goes, and then I guess everybody will kind of assess things uh, once that happens. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, let's move right into logistics. All right, so moving on to logistics. Uh, pretty big change to this slide. Uh, I've just finally decided that it's a lot simpler and easier uh, to put an actual legend on this slide because far too many people could not read and uh, it was just getting in the way of things. So I finally made the the column on the left hand side of the slide an actual legend for what's on the screen. It makes it a little easier for people to screenshot if they wanted to share it and things like that. And we'll talk about the national level concerns here in a minute. But as far as events from last time, School bus driver shortage continues. However, Massachusetts, uh, their mission for their National Guard driving uh, kids to school, uh, that mission is complete, and we'll talk more about that in just a bit, again, when we get to the National Guard slides. Uh, as far as the water shortage out west, that continues to be a problem. As a matter of fact, here is the recent drought monitor chart, at least as of uh, November 9th. It was again released just a few days ago on November 11th and as you can see the western United States is still very much in a state of drought, a severe drought. So we're gonna have to see how that plays with the winter weather coming into the area uh, over the winter season. Also the microchip shortage has gotten quite a bit worse. Um, manufacturers are, it's gotten worse but it's also gotten a little bit better and by better I mean you're not getting your money's worth. So, for for instance, Tesla has stopped incorporating a few uh, charging options with some of their devices, like they've left out the USB chargers and things like that. Uh, General Motors is removing the heated seats and the heated steering wheels from their crossover vehicles and pretty much all of their pickup trucks. So, a lot of these uh, vehicles uh, manufacturers are simply leaving parts out that they can so they can get these vehicles out the door and they will either plan to have you come back into a dealership to install for free when they get the, the parts back in or it might not ever happen who really knows you know this chip shortage we're still projecting it to last for at least two years uh, of course varying in severity but we really don't know um, likewise the tire shortage in uh, Montana uh, continues uh, in localized areas there's really not much more to add on that we're just seeing a few more news stations essentially do circular reporting and talk about that one article we found from last time so just because you're seeing more reports doesn't necessarily mean that more shortages are occurring it just means that more news stations are buying that article and affiliates are starting to talk about it because they purchase the rights to that story so that's why these shortages things it's really hard to track um, and then new for this cycle are snow plow and salt truck drivers uh, being in quite severe shortage at least there uh, you can see in the northern states and in the parts of the midwest uh, that is a severe shortage in a lot of areas uh, they're doing things like recruiting uh, for the first time, they've never had to recruit for uh, a, a snowplow driver, but some states are now. Other states are increasing or trying to offer bonuses or increasing their hourly rate, rates and wages and things like that. Again, it, it's hard to say if it's going to work or do anything or, 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 or have any kind of impact at all, but if you're in a northern area and you get a lot of snow and you regularly have to get your... Um, uh, roads plowed. This is something you should be concerned about. Even places down here uh, in the mid-Atlantic region or even further south, those places in the south that get like a quarter of an inch of snow a year. You know, you guys know if you grew up in those areas where you get one snow day a year and it's only like a dusting, the entire state will shut down. Like that's what I remember growing up and uh, you still have people plowing the roads for like a dusting and uh, that's a huge concern as well. So you have the volume issues from the northern states where there's literally so much snow on the road that you cannot drive and there's a sh shortage of snowplow drivers to physically clear the roads and then there's also the cultural cultural thing of some of the more um, warmer states not getting as much snow but snowplow, snowplow drivers and salt trucks are so much more important in a lot of these areas because people are just not used to the snow so the impact can be quite high uh, in a lot of these states when it comes to uh, the winter weather creeping in. 
Also, before I move to the next slide, the liquor shortage has kind of expanded. We're seeing Connecticut uh, being uh, impacted by the liquor shortage as well. Texas, we're still seeing articles pop up here and there, and people, you know, posting pictures of uh, liquor st store shelves being empty. This is kind of a thing that's hit or miss because we're getting into the holiday season. Uh, the whole pandemic thing made everybody start drinking a little bit more, so demand has gone up sharply, and production hasn't. Uh, been able to keep up with that so the liquor shortages are kind of a hard thing to track as well so let's move into the next slide and we'll talk about the national level shortages that are kind of prevalent throughout the entire country now i know this slide's pretty ugly and looks kind of empty right now but trust me this is going to fill out sadly it's going to fill out quite significantly over the next few weeks and months um, but for now this is what we've got when it comes to the things that we know are in national level shortages where basically you can go to anywhere in the United States and find a shortage of this kind of stuff. So really the biggest one uh, or, or one of the bigger ones is Christmas trees. Obviously Christmas trees are highly seasonal and Christmas trees take forever, sometimes decades to grow. So it makes sense that there would be a shortage of that around this time of year. There are shortages of Christmas trees in some areas of the United States every year because of a drought, you know, 10 years ago. That's just how this works with the Christmas tree market. So higher demand this year, you know, uh, problems with production and of course shipping and things like that are going to mean that some parts of the country are going to have a hard time finding Christmas trees. But really the biggest one that I wanted to, to touch on is fertilizer. So for, for the fertilizer shortage, uh, specifically diammonium phosphate, really in the United States, we're just seeing rumint at this point, writing a rumor intelligence, right, um, of certain fertilizers being in short supply. Um, this kind of makes sense uh, because around the world, this is a huge deal. Uh, China is cutting down on exports a lot due to a coal shortage in China which has caused an electrical power shortage in China, which is directly impacting the ability to process fertilizer in China, which reduces supply, and with India's increasing demand for fertilizer, we're, we're essentially having a case of world events killing the cat that ate the rat that lived in the house that America built, right? So we have all this stuff lining up, and it's going to domino effect uh, into the United States not having so much fertilizer. Um, at least that's what makes sense. It makes sense that these fertilizer shortages will reach the United States at some point, but again, nothing is set in stone. And honestly, like most of these shortages that I'm mentioning, it's probably not even worth talking about because it's pretty much impossible to determine when and where shortages will strike, especially considering the fact that we also make fertilizer here in the U.S., but just like always, our intensely complex globalistic logistical networks make it impossible to track these things with any level of real satisfaction. But I did just want to mention it anyway. And again, on the slide as well, uh, we are experiencing na a nationwide shortage of medical personnel, police officers, firefighters, and more of your trauma emergency personnel like EMTs, paramedics, EMS, uh, transport drivers, and things like that. So I'll talk more about that in just a bit, but I did want to touch on it here as well. And sticking with the theme of logistics, let's talk a little bit about a trend that is occurring in grocery stores all over the world. And that trend is stores attempting to conceal their supply chain issues with photographs or selectively staged products. So this has always been a practice in most grocery stores from an advertising standpoint. And just one of the things that you do as a, like a grocery store manager or owner. A lot of grocery stores, uh, pretty much every grocery store I can think of, they do things like backfilling the shelves when they run out of items. So that instead of having an empty shelf for a customer to look at, customers receive full shelves. But not the normal products that they normally might see. Most stores did this with the toilet paper shortages from last year. Like, think about it. Toilet paper is a very big, bulky product, and it usually has an entire aisle dedicated to it. So, rather than have an entire aisle empty, they put things like bundles of firewood or other large products on the shelves that normally held toilet paper so that customers wouldn't see empty shelves. So, why would a company do this? Why would a company want to make sure customers don't see empty shelves? Well, it's pretty simple. 
Market research consistently proves that people tend to shop more when the shelves are full and products are correctly fronted and faced, meaning that products, they're not at the back of the shelves, right? They're moved right up forward, right, right up front near the edge with all the labels aligned forward towards the customer. So I say all of that to hopefully shed some light on these practices. Yes, deception is a factor. All advertising is deception. But there is a huge leap between a company wanting to fill a void on a shelf to make it look better for a customer and a company actively concealing a supply chain shortage because of a political reason. The latter scenario is something that is straight out of the Soviet Union, and despite what the experts on Twitter will tell you, this is not usually the motivation for doing this, which is why I am showing you these two images. Both images were taken in a Tesco in the United Kingdom, as that grocery store chain has been observed to do this kind of a lot lately, so they have the best examples. And in the image on the left, empty produce containers are being filled with uh, cardboard cutouts of artistic photos of oranges. And on the right, empty laundry detergent shelves are holding pictures of the product rather than the actual product itself. These two images are very different in motivation. In the image on the left, it's obviously supposed to be artistic. It's supposed to be a, a nice thing to look at rather than an empty plastic container. The oranges are the size of soccer balls and obviously even like cut open in the picture. How often do you see soccer ball sized oranges on the shelf that are actually cut up? Like it, when it comes to this photo, the deception factor is quite low, right? There's not a whole lot of intentional deception here. It's just something nice to look at rather than an empty container. Yes, the store could have just left the boxes empty and not put a cardboard cutout, but all in all, in the image on the left, this is really just for aesthetically pleasing reasons. But let's take a closer look at the other photo. This photo is a much different story. In fact, when I first saw this image myself, I had to do a double take because the optical illusion was so good. These photos are actually of the proper containers on the shelf, scaled appropriately and with the right lighting conditions to make it look like the shelves are full. In other words, you might literally walk past this shelf and not even notice anything is wrong. Of course, looking at a two-dimensional image is obviously different from looking at this shelf with your two eyes in person. But these images are quite clearly meant to maintain the illusion that there is something on the shelf. Plus, combined with the normal pricing signage and the disclaimer that these products can be purchased, they're just behind the counter so they can be rationed, this image has a lot more perceived deception than the other image. And I say perceived deception because there's really no way to tell. This could be just some super stellar rock star work by an employee who took the time to photograph these products in the right lighting and then print out a two scale oversized image on photo paper and put it in a frameless, low-profile plastic holder that's almost invisible. That's possible, but as an analyst, I know good camouflage when I see it, and my assessment is that this specific practice in this specific image is intended to conceal a shortage. As for the reasons for that concealment, who knows? It could be financially based or it could be political, taking the North Korea approach to trying to pretend like everything is perfectly fine when the store is empty. It could be any of these reasons. I don't know. I just wanted to point this out because to me it's utterly fascinating, and I would urge everyone to pay attention to these kinds of camouflage efforts. This stuff is pretty crazy, and often done in advance of, and in preparation for, an impending shortage. So you might notice that if a grocery store is trying to hide something, and you detect these camouflage efforts early enough, you might be one of the last few lucky ones to get that product from behind the counter while they still have it. And before most people even discover the camouflage and notice that there is a shortage of something. And moving on to kind of going back to uh, what we had last time when it comes to the mandate update. So I 
We're not legal experts. I'm certainly not a lawyer, so I don't understand a lot of this stuff, but I can read pretty well, I think. And it seems like there's a lot of stuff going on here. So let's let's tackle it. So this first mandate, right, the one in green up at uh, up on the top, with that every private company with 100 more employees must get uh, the employees jabbed, right? That actually came out. So OSHA officially ordered that mandate, and pretty much instantly, a court put it on hold. Likewise, uh, the federal contractor mandate uh, that was expanded a little bit, or at least I, I guess the wording was. Uh, changed slightly and despite the fact that several federal judges have uh, over the past few months since the beginning of October the beginning of November uh, they have declined and refused to put that uh, order on hold another federal judge appears to have put this one on hold as well um, so really the the question is what is going on uh, when it comes to these mandates now when it comes to you guys in the military you guys are still screwed. Um, yes, we know about the things like the Comirnaty shots not actually available uh, for anybody. So technically, all of these mandates, all of these orders, are illegal orders, um, and you can get into the weeds on that as well. But as far as for our guys in the military who are being faced with this kind of stuff, uh, really, there's not a whole lot of new information that we have, and others are doing a far better job at covering it uh, than than we can do. Uh, the point is, is that a lot of these mandates are coming on hold, but companies are still kind of going forward. Like, you know, the regime said, hey, doesn't matter what the court says, go forward and go ahead and, and still order these mandates. Well, <laughs> what? <laughs> this isn't the Soviet Union, you know, at least not yet. So it's, it's really hard to say if companies and even if the federal regime is going to go by a court and clearly the federal regime has made it quite clear that they are not going to abide by a court's regulations so i guess we'll have to see on that but i just wanted to let everybody know that what we briefed last time is kind of on hold for now it, it went into place and then now it's on hold so we'll see how it turns out hopefully we'll be able to um, roll back some of this authoritarianism but you never really know so that's enough on that. Let's roll into critical infrastructure concerns. So, a lot of interesting stuff this time. Uh, really, the first one to kind of get it out of the way because it's the one that we know least about, and that is a U.S. defense contractor was hit with a cyber attack a few days ago. This cyber uh, this uh, cyber attack was uh, implemented on the systems of a contracting group called Electronic Warfare Associates. Uh, and basically, it was a data breach. Uh, at least what the what the company has publicly said, it seems like it's financial in nature. Uh, like they just wanted to steal some credit card numbers and uh, birth certificates from the employees. But you never really know because literally the name of the company is Electronic Warfare Associates. I wonder what kind of stuff they do. Those of you that have a couple of brain cells to rub together can imagine that they do things like build radar. Uh, they build uh, communication setups and satellite communication uh, suites and simulators and other kinds of training equipment and things like that. And a lot of electronic warfare packages and softwares and things like that for the U.S. military. So, you know, this is the second time they've been hit with a ransomware attack. They were hit... Uh, last year as well, as well, and that was a ransomware attack. This was when the ransomware attacks were kind of gaining traction amongst the defense community. Uh, so something to keep an eye on, really not a whole lot any of us can do from a you know average citizen you know standpoint, but I did think it was kind of interesting. And really the most interesting one on the slide, <laughs> interesting, <laughs> interesting that the most interesting one on the slide is <laughs> point two when I literally have smallpox on the slide last. Uh, <laughs> point two there is the first, uh, I say first, uh, domestic UAS attack on an electrical substation. So the U.S. Intel community released uh, some details to a few different journalistic websites. And uh, this photograph actually of an a uh, UAS system, a, a DJI drone, that was used to attack an electrical substation. So, this is allegedly the first time this has been done. I know personally that this is definitely not the first time this has been done. This has been done many times before, uh, but this is the first time that the U.S. Intel community has actually come out and said, yeah, this was a, re this was a legitimate attack. Now, the attack was a failure uh, because the drone actually didn't make it to the electrical substation. However, uh, whoever did this attack is one smart cookie because this is exactly the kind of technology that the U.S. military still uses and used very famously uh, during the uh, Iraq invasion uh, to take out uh, Saddam's uh, electrical substations. Basically, 
uh, there's this electrical substations obviously have a lot of exposed wires so the, the the US military doctrine or at least the doctrine that was used at the time was to use stealth fighters to get in there launch some uh, I think there were tomahawk missiles that actually trailed behind the missile a very thin carbon uh, filament and that wire would then fall through the air and uh, land on top of an electrical substation cause a shortage and that's your uh, that's your attack on the substation. You end up uh, taking an entire neighborhood, uh, their entire uh, neighborhood's electricity offline without ever killing anyone at all. And that's kind of the the goal of that kind of military munition. Now this UAS system used almost the exact same thing. It was as simple as you can see in the image, the very blurry image that the U.S. government provided. Uh, it was a uh, a drone system with a trailing copper wire or some kind of uh, some kind of wire that was intended to cause a short at the electrical substation. Again, very smart, uh, very smart level attack. So whoever did this has some knowledge of how this stuff works, or at least has Google or maybe a history book. In any case, I thought it was very interesting um, that this kind of thing is now occurring. We've seen similar things uh, with. Uh, a bunch of Antifa guys uh, putting coat racks and things like that, or coat hangers on um, uh, railroad uh, crossings and things like that. There, there have been a lot of attacks on critical infrastructure that nobody really reports on because guess who does it? It's Antifa, right? So the you know mainstream media doesn't want to talk about Antifa because, well, many reasons, I guess. But this is an interesting thing. Nobody really knows who who did it. Um, or at least they're not publicly saying who did it, or and no group has claimed responsibility, so it could just be a lone lone guy. But as you can see, a lone guy with a couple hundred dollar drone and you know twenty feet of wire can certainly uh, cause a lot of problems for for the United States. And moving on to number three, there our strategic oil reserves are uh, actually down. Now this is something that a lot of uh, websites are actually just picking up on. Uh, this has been a thing that's been going on for months now. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why anybody suddenly starts reading the EIA's website, uh, but really our, our the report was released this morning, uh, or I think maybe yesterday morning, that our strategic petroleum reserves are currently at, they're sitting at around 433 million barrels, which is 7% below the five-year average. So our strategic oil reserves are down, our gasoline reserves are down. Our um, gasoline blending components uh, levels, that's doing okay, which makes sense because that's, it's only on demand of, of gasoline and things like that. So our, uh, our petroleum products are not doing super hot right now. As far as why or what this means, well, you can, you can talk hours about this with people who are vastly more intelligent than us on this topic. But basically, uh, one of the problems, one of the reasons for these problems in the oil community is demand. Uh, demand went down, uh, and then it came back up sharply. And production uh, has had a lot of problems. Uh, you also have medical mandates, uh, people walking out and things like that. So now you've got a supply issue. So you've got some issues on the supply side of things. You've got issues on the demand side of things. And the nature of how our logistics work in this country mean that if there's a problem at any level, um, that problem is going to spread quite quickly. So something to keep an eye on. Definitely need to figure out um, or start thinking about um, alternative energy uh, methods, uh, which is kind of something we've talked about before. But I don't know about you, but I can't make gasoline in my garage, right? I can't go into my backyard and pump petroleum out of the ground and then put it in my car. It doesn't work like that. So the federal government controls the strategic oil reserves. The federal government has the ability to turn a pipeline on or, or off, uh, as we learned uh, quite quickly uh, a few months ago. So the, 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 the bottom line, I guess, is to start thinking about your energy needs because this stuff is important and uh, it can, it can uh, come upon you, sneak up on you really quickly. And speaking of sneaking around, uh, number four, there is uh, apparently now we have to deal with smallpox. Um, this is a story that just came out uh, a few days ago, but a worker in a Merrick uh, research facility uh, discovered they were cleaning out the freezer and came upon, uh, I think, 15 vials of that were, that were labeled smallpox. Um, and for those of you who might not understand, this is uh, probably one of the biggest deals that's going to hit the, the world this year, because smallpox is kind of a big deal. 
Uh, smallpox has been eradicated since uh, 1980. Officially, there have been zero cases of smallpox on the planet since 1980. Uh, there have been mishaps and there have been accidents where people get smallpox, but researchers working with it. But, but here's the kicker. There are only two places in the entire world that are allowed to have smallpox. One of those is the CDC Center in Atlanta. And the other one is the State Research Center of Virology and Biotechnology in Russia's Siberia, also known as the Vector Institute. So you've got the CDC and some random secret squirrel probably run by the FSB facility in Siberia. And it's a little bit out of place for smallpox, which has, again, been eradicated globally since 1980. And only two places on the planet can even possess it. Uh, it's a little weird for smallpox to pop up in a freezer outside of Philly. Um, and that's so, yeah, kind of a problem. Uh, I don't know what this means. Uh, I'm sure that our, uh, <laughs> I'm sure our conspiracy theory brethren are freaking out over this right now. But as of right now, there's no data. There's no data to analyze. So we just know the vials were found. The FBI is investigating if, you know, and of course, <laughs> the FBI investigating anything these days is probably a strong indicator of some kind of nefarious uh, activity based on what the FBI is currently interested in, um, which we'll talk about again in just a minute. But who really knows? There's no, there's really no telling as to what this means or, or anything like that. But this could just be a colossal, colossal mistake. There's no tell. It could be intentional. Who knows? There's no data to say either way. Um, I just wanted to point out that it did in fact happen, um, mostly for posterity's sake, I guess. So let's go ahead and move into significant governmental actions. And right to start with is an event that really isn't uh, something that occurred even in the United States, but I thought I'd mention it because it kind of matters a lot. Uh, so this is this occurred in Australia. Uh, and uh, the Australian government uh, discovered that the uh, store chain, a 7-Eleven, uh, actively collected hyper-accurate imagery for facial recognition purposes, called you know face prints. So I know, kind of ironic, that the Australian government, out of all the governments on the earth, is the one that's concerned about overreach and spying and things like that. But I did want to mention it because it's kind of interesting, because there are kind of a lot of 7-Elevens here in the United States, and you never really know what uh, the system is going to be doing, right? Uh, the way that this collection worked in Australia was there was a, a sort of like an iPad uh, kiosk station set up uh, for customers to take surveys and things like that, and they were capturing people's uh, facial images uh, several times during that. So um, I don't know if it's just some kind of, uh, in the United States, I don't know if, if this is a factor or not. I did just want to point it out, though, because it's yet another company that is going above and beyond to spy on people uh, in the corporate uh, world. So I thought it was kind of interesting to note. Moving on to number two there, the Biden regime's nomination for the Comptroller of Currency, uh, Sauli Omrova, has been revealed to be a very radical choice, as one might expect from the Biden regime at this point. Uh, she has made statements in the past, which, of course, you'd expect conservative mainstream media to pick up. Um, some of these quotes are that she wants, quote, the complete migration of, de of demand deposit accounts to the Federal Reserve, um, meaning that she wants you to not have a savings account. She wants me to not have a savings account or a checking account. And quite literally, the Federal Reserve will decide how much money you get. Uh, that's what she wants. Uh, she's also made statements that she wants to, quote, bankrupt the energy sector for climate change purposes and things like that. Uh, she's also, she's, uh, of course, as you might expect, an unabashed communist. Um, in her doctoral thesis in college uh, was titled Karl Marx's Economic Analysis and the Theory of Revolution in Das Kapital, uh, Marx's book, or ghost-written book, however you want to define that. Um, so, yeah, she's a very extreme choice. Uh, this is going to be not super great. Um, as one might expect, look, economics is one of those things where if most people figured it out, the whole system would collapse. If even just a percentage of people figured it out, the entire system would collapse. If anybody actually knew what the Federal, what the federal Reserve did, um, this country would be very different. Um, but I'm not hanging my hat on any hopes that people might do this, do this research and figure out what this stuff is. Uh, the point is, is that... Now would be a very good time to reassess your eggs and make sure they aren't all in the same basket. 
Um, I find it very hard to believe that the U.S. government is going to start sucking money out of personal savings accounts tomorrow, but clearly they have the capability. And as this regime has shown us, and I suppose other regimes as well, other, other regimes around the world, and even other prior presidential administrations, if it can happen, it will happen. So that's the thing that I guess we should be prepared for. Um, as far as specific things to do, I'm not an eco economics expert, so I don't feel comfortable uh, really telling people what to do. All I can say is be smart, diversify, do all the good things that you know are economically sound, and we can research this a little bit more and figure out what to do later. But by and large, uh, the system is, is not as secure as we were led to believe. Like, I grew up in a world where it was perhaps a, a false hope, I guess, but you put money in a bank account and you were going to be sure that it was going to be there when you retired. Um, that's not the case anymore. Uh, I don't think that's been the case for a very long time, probably since before even I was born. But the point is, is that we're here now, and um, if you don't understand even the basic economic structures of how this country works and how it's supposed to work and how it actually works, um, you should probably start researching that. That would be a good idea to, to do moving forward. So I'll just leave it there at that, and we can talk about that more later. Um, but moving on to number three, uh, this was kind of an inflammatory one that came out on social media. This was a video that occurred that, that kind of came out in which in, in Texas, a, a certain antibody treatment for a certain um, viral um, uh, infection, right, was denied based on purely racial criteria, right? No, the, the antibodies are not available, or at least the video, uh, in the video, um, the uh, hospital worker uh, says that the uh, options for this antibody treatment are not available to white or Asian patients. As ordered, as written into the criteria by Texas's Department of Health and Human Services. So, as of, I, gosh, I think actually as of this morning, you know, Greg Abbott's office has not yet responded to this event, um, but it seems like Texas's Department of Health and Human Services uh, has started denying treatment based on racial means. This comes, if, if this is true, again, we don't really know anything. This is one social media post, one guy's video. We don't really know what the deal is. However, many journalists, uh, of, of course, again, untrustworthy mainstream media or, uh, journalists, have physically called um, the Department of Health and Human Services, and they have confirmed it, at least to the journalists. So I don't know how much more confirmation you need uh, for that, but it seems like this is definitely the practice, at least in Texas. Um, and I guess we'll have to see how that how that works out. It's not really any particular surprise uh, from us because we've been tracking medical groups denying treatment based on race for, wow, gosh, two years now, I guess. But I just wanted to point it out that if you're in Texas, I would look into this a little bit more. Or if you're in really any state, look into this more and see what your local hospitals are doing. Moving on to number four there, um, man, New York City is just... I don't know what to even say about it. It's it's gotten to the point to where it's it's beyond any kind of fantasy novel we can try to try to compare it to. Uh, and really, the the flavor this week is um, Bill De Blasio uh, wants uh, five year olds to show uh, show papers right when they're entering businesses. So this has already been a thing in San Francisco and some par other parts of California as well. Um, and now you, New York is kind of getting on this train. And and look. Um, really, the only thing I have to say on that is we here, all the staff here, recommend leaving New York City and other cities like it as soon as you can. Um, yes, it's not as easy to move these days, um, and job uncertainty is at an all-time high. Um, and even amongst ourselves here, uh, most of our staff here cannot afford to move to a more remote area uh, just yet because it's just too expensive. And... Um, yeah, but if you live in some of these more dystopian cities like New York, uh, anywhere in California, right, 
Like I myself have never been one to recommend moving away from a problem, right? Because that problem is just going to follow you. Look at Texas, right? Texas, a lot of as a whole, right? Dallas and Austin, extremely politically nut cities now, um, and that's because people were leaving California for Texas. Um, so we know, and I know in myself that this cancer just kind of follows you. However. Um, you also have to do what's right for you and your family. And I, I can't even imagine how it must feel to have your your five-year-old child show papers to a police officer. Um, I, I just can't, I can't fathom that. And um, yeah, so our recommendation here is to try to find a place where you can rest and recoup, regroup, you know, someplace cheaper, New York's expensive place to live and see what you can do to help get this country out of the gutter we're in. So I'll just leave it at that, and uh, we can move on to number five, which is equally cheery in that uh, the main P company there, um, I'm self-censoring this one because I have no freaking clue as to what algorithms YouTube is using to listen to what I'm saying right now. But in any case, the big company, the big P company we all know about that makes uh, alleged medicine, um, has been confirmed to falsify data to indicate that not as many people suffered from adverse reactions during the trials. Shocker, I know. It's almost like we said that we've, we and hundreds of other thousands of people have been saying this for literally years now. Um, and it, it just turns out that the truth is that more people died after getting the jab than died unjabbed, at least during the clinical trials of Pfizer. But don't take my word for it. Please don't. Uh, go and check out the sources we have. Uh, you can check the links, research the, the uh, peer-reviewed articles there, or the articles that are currently being peer-reviewed, and you can research the data yourself. It's pretty easy to do at this point. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to point out that that did occur. And then before we move on to anything else, I did briefly want to touch on this. So this is a letter, or at least the first two pages of a letter, that was sent by uh, Jim Jordan to uh, the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland. And I'll just read the first paragraph to kind of give you the abstract of what this is about. So, Dear Attorney General Garland, Last month during your testimony before the Judiciary Committee, you testified that the Department of Justice and Federal Bureau of Investigation were not using federal counterterrorism tools to target concerned parents at local school board meetings. We are now in receipt of a protected disclosure from a department whistleblower showing that the FBI's counterterrorism division is compiling and categorizing threat assessments related to parents, including a document directing FBI personnel to use a specific, quote, threat tag to track potential investigation. This new information calls into question the accuracy and completeness of your sworn testimony. So you can read the full letter yourself. Uh, there's page one and two. Here is the third page. And here is the actual evidence. So these are the screenshots of the email that pretty much indicates that uh, senior FBI leadership uh, is, in fact, collecting intelligence on U.S. persons uh, with regards to parents and school board meetings. Um, this email from senior FBI leadership uh, references quite clearly uh, that Merrick Garland quite literally and openly lied under oath and that the FBI is using their intelligence collection tools to spy on and specifically target investigations towards parents who get slightly upset at school board meetings. So, yeah, I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, because, um, but I think that it's pretty clear right now what the FBI's intentions are. Um, and again, just for those of you who don't know, uh, Merrick Garland, the, uh, the Attorney General, um, for those of you who don't remember, is the father-in-law of Alexander Tanner. Um, Alexander Tanner is the co-founder of a company uh, that has very large contracts, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of contracts, to provide critical race theory propaganda curriculum to school systems. So... Uh, there's quite literally the most clear of conflicts of interest in this case. And, you know, again, I don't want to be just some other guy that's shouting about this on the Internet. But, man, like, you've, you've got to talk about this kind of stuff um, and kind of get a feel for how dystopian we are 
and uh, it's pretty dystopian. So got the FBI openly uh, targeting parents at school board meetings instead of the um, Islamic insurgents that are running around this country because I don't know if anybody remembered or not, but um, the uh, Virginia State Police and about 30 different law enforcement groups were saying that there were ISIS militants running around uh, Virginia planning an attack um, yeah, a couple weeks ago and uh, didn't hear anything back from that. So um, they didn't announce that they caught the guys. Uh, they did not. It, it, they did not announce that anything had happened. So I guess we have to assume that those uh, ISIS militants are still in this country and still at large. But again, the FBI is more concerned about parents not wanting their children to learn critical race theory in school. So again, quite dystopian, but let's go ahead and punch forward into the National Guard deployments for this cycle. So here is your reference slide and let's move right into the Northeast. So the biggest one for this cycle is the mission accomplished. So for Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts, uh, their mission to drive children to school is officially over. Uh, they had, uh, by their own admission, over 500 soldiers doing this. I don't think that anybody liked that. Um, and if anybody sort of liked the idea of, of what that precedent was, uh, what that precedent became, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they haven't read too many books in their life. But in any case, you should not be seeing any soldiers driving children to school in the state of Massachusetts anymore. Uh, at least for now, and until when they uh, put this mission back on again, because that's how uh, that's how things work, right? So there's there you go on that. Also, we don't have much more information about New York. Uh, they're keeping that very tight-lipped as to how much how many soldiers are actually deployed to New York area hospitals. Uh, we know the deployment occurred. Uh, we know the deployment is currently occurring. We just don't have numbers and we don't have units. Um, so something to something to to keep in mind moving forward and also no real update on Connecticut uh doing the same so i guess we'll have to wait and see on that uh likewise moving forward into the southeast absolutely no change here um we're seeing numbers fluctuate wildly so as time goes on and as we don't make any changes to these slides become more inaccurate um but we don't have any information to put on them so um yeah, there you go. Or at least we don't have any information that can be talked about and can be verified in an open source manner. I should say that that way. Uh, but moving forward into the big one uh, for this cycle is the Midwest. Obviously, uh, the Wisconsin National Guard has been activated in Kenosha um, for domestic policing actions and things like that. So those guys are going to be on the ground for a while um, following this verdict. Whenever it comes out um, and see how that works out. But no, no other change uh, so far. Uh, also, uh, the southwestern region, a lot of troops still on the ground. The border mission is expanding every day, um, and it's getting a little bit more hairy down there at the border. But I haven't really had time to sit down and do the bean counting and figure out how many units are there and how many more people are there. So, sorry this slide hasn't been updated in a couple weeks, but that's pretty much what I've got on this one. Uh, and then very similar situation uh, out west. I do know the Oregon mission is winding down mostly because that letter uh, that I mentioned last time was sent. Uh, it ruffled some feathers, so uh, as it will, as it rightly should. Um, so the Oregon National Guard, Air National Guard, is uh, reducing that mission quite significantly. So that's really all I have on that. And moving forward into the school mask mandates, I do have one change, and that is Tennessee. Unfortunately, a judge has blocked the mask mandate ban. Um, so this is kind of confusing here. Um, a judge didn't outright block it, um, but the judge said that both parties in the lawsuit have to maintain the status quo until it can go to court. Which is, in practicality, this is like we're having to, people are having to interpret. Well, what does the judge actually mean? Um, so this effectively means that the mandate ban has been blocked, and he. But again, this gets more complicated because not really many people know how to interpret this court order, and a lot of school districts are saying yes, that yay, the judge, the judge blocked the mask mandate ban. Now we're going to require masks for school. So uh, now it looks like a significant number of uh, dis school districts in Tennessee are now requiring masks for school. Now again, it, there's a difference between endorsing a, a mask mandate and um, 
not allowing a mandate ban. There's a difference there, right? That's why there's different colors on this slide here. But in practicality, it looks like a lot of a lot of school districts are going are using this court order as kind of a de facto victory, and in using that as a way to institute mask mandates. Remember, like I mentioned last time, a lot of companies, a lot of entities around the world, they're just waiting to use that excuse. Well, we were just following orders, right? The classic excuse from uh, a certain political party in a regime during the 1930s and 40s, right? We were just following orders. We didn't really do any of this stuff ourselves. Well, look at look around the country. There are so many hundreds, if not thousands of places that are chomping at the bit to use that excuse. We were just following orders. And school districts are one of those. So they saw this they saw this order and they're saying, "Okay, they're using that as to to stomp on the gas when it comes to mask mandates." So Huge problem for Tennessee. I'm sure that it, it will probably get ironed out here soon because all these lawsuits are actually finally making it to court now, but we'll see. As far as the jab and mandates themselves, really no major change here. California is still doing stupid California things, and I'm sure other states will probably follow suit soon, but you never really know. Uh, really what I want to do is push forward into this slide, the overall resistance tracker, because there's one major change over where the wind comes sweeping down the plane. That's right. In Oklahoma, the National Guard... Uh, Adjutant General there has ordered that uh, National Guard members in Oklahoma will not be mandated to get the jab as long as they stay on Title 32 orders. If they federalize, they go on Title 10, as in if the president federalizes them, they will be required because the federal government has a different thing. But the Adjutant General has said that he is taking his orders from the governor as long as they are on Title 32 orders. So, gold star to Oklahoma. This is great. This is the first state that we're aware of where a a state national guard is actually going against the federal government and this is a huge deal i don't think people realize how big of a deal this is for a national guard unit a national guard for a state to go against a federal mandate that's just completely unheard of and it's it's good to see now, oklahoma's national guard is not super big um so it kind of makes sense but uh, I think that's a very good metric to track. So, actually moving forward, I wanted to end on some good news uh, before we hit the international stuff um, for once, right? Talking about some good news, right? So, I built this slide to show which companies and entities are being forced to go against the mandates because they can't afford to lose their employees. So, this is obviously not a complete list. Uh, but this is a fantastic way to measure the effect effectiveness of resistance efforts. Remember, being able to assess resistance effectiveness is very important because it shows the areas that we can put more effort into and the areas that are a lot, you know, kind of a lost cause, right? Plus, it's very handy for the average person to know just how many other people out there are resisting, right? It's not like the mainstream media is talking about this resistance in any form or fashion, um, unless it hits, unless it's you know able to sell newspapers. But uh, showing the effective resistance, uh, this can completely eliminate the bystander effect and let people know that they are not alone, and thus increasing the resistance to this stuff even more significantly. So first up is Chicago. Uh, over one-third of Chicago Police Department officers missed the jab mandate uh, deadline. And uh, also, a judge has temporarily blocked uh, Lori Lightfoot's uh, mandate that the Chicago PD um, jab all of their officers. So they're, they're kind of sitting pretty right now. Um, I can tell you, one-third of officers walking off the job will be devastating for any law enforcement group whatsoever. So those guys are actually... Their resistance has been pretty effective so far. It got the uh, it got Lori Lightfoot to back down at least for now. So very interesting to talk about. Also, like I mentioned, the Oklahoma National Guard, their jab mandate has been rescinded. So troops, uh, National Guard soldiers in Oklahoma no longer have to get the jab. Moving into airlines, uh, Southwest Airlines, of course, uh, mand uh, rescinded their jab mandate a long time ago, several weeks ago, actually, uh, because they simply couldn't do it. They couldn't afford the pilots that were walking off the job, so they had to rescind their mandate. Uh, American Airlines has also sort of done the same thing, but a little softer. They extended the deadline significantly um, for their jab mandate, so 
Again, more pressure can be applied to American Airlines and a few of other the other of these airlines that we've been tracking um, to make sure that uh, people realize you know, they, they they realize that people don't want this stuff. And then also more along the lines of critical infrastructure, we have two real big big ones this week, and that is uh, Ingalls Shipbuilding. Uh, they have rescinded their jab uh, mandate. The, these guys build ships for the Navy. Um, and they have a significant, a significant um, portion of shipbuilding operations going on in like Newport News, Norfolk area, for the Navy and things like that. So they rescinded their uh, jab mandate because they could, they literally could not afford to have their people walk off the job. Same thing in Alaska. The uh, Alaska Railroad Company they uh, rescinded their mandate as well. Now this one's a little weird. Um, because Alaska Railroad initially sent an email to their workers that stated that we, they were going to follow the mandate. Uh, but just a couple of days later, uh, the board voted unanimously to defy the mandate, right? So we assess with pretty high confidence that this was prob- this change of heart was probably due to a wave of resistance from the railroad workers um, saying they're going to quit. Uh, because only 53% of the entire company's uh, 692 employees have been jabbed so far. So firing half of your workforce is completely unsustainable. They, Alaska Railroad probably couldn't even afford to, to cut loose 1% of their workforce, to be honest. That would be way too much for them. So um, very interesting. I did want to, to talk about this kind of stuff because, hey, look, it, it looks like the world's falling apart at the seams, right? Like we know this is kind of a there's so much negativity going on around uh, around the world, um, but I, I can tell you that a lot of this stuff, hey, the resistance is doing is, is doing something, and I just wanted to kind of point that out before we jumped into the international stuff. And speaking of international stuff, let's go ahead and jump right into that. A uh, lot of interesting things happening, and a lot of things that are kind of scary. So really, the, one of the scarier ones is Russia. Uh, so Russia confirmed that they did indeed use an Earth-based weapons system to destroy a satellite in orbit, uh, which the U.S. initially called a debris-generating event because the debris cloud from this this explosion right, was a concern for other satellites in orbit, to include the International Space Station. Um, but, you know, Russia's going to do Russian things, right? So this is a pretty big deal uh, because both, US, both the U.S. and Russia have been working on developing this counter-satellite technology for a very long time. Uh, but for the most part, both of our nations have been kind of keeping a low profile uh, with this kind of stuff because blowing up a satellite in orbit is a massive provocation um, by either side, right? So every single nation on Earth knows that the U.S. is diplomatically and internationally weak right now, and Russia has been running hog wild as a direct result of this. So we're certainly going to have to dig into this one a bit more and probably do a dedicated video on it for all six people who are interested in this kind of stuff, but for now it's going to be curious to see what the U.S. government response is going to be if there is one at all. Moving forward to the United Kingdom, man, our friends across the pond are not doing so hot right now. There was a uh, pretty big terror attack in Liverpool. Um, there's really not much to, to mention on the attack itself other than that it, it kind of happened. Uh, the assailant was a 32-year-old asylum seeker who detonated an explosive device from the back seat of a taxi cab uh, outside of a women's, uh, women's hospital on Sunday. Uh, the taxi driver, uh, David Perry, uh, is a British, you know, a British citizen, uh, survived the attack. Um, and as time goes on, I assume we're going to learn more details about the specifics of the attack and what's happened and things like that. Um, but in response to this incident, the UK terror threat level has been raised to severe. Uh, and this is because this attack is the second uh, Islamic terror attack within a month. Uh, following the stabbing uh, murder of um, the British uh, Member of Parliament, David Amos, by another Islamic extremist. So the United Kingdom as a whole is, uh, like I mentioned, uh, not doing super well uh, when it comes to the terrorism threats uh, becoming more significant. Um, and as, as always, you know, once one event happens, another copycat event happens, they usually come in waves, right? So uh, hopefully this is not the w rise of another wave, but uh, we're definitely going to be keeping an eye out um, from our uh, friends, uh, friends across, the, across the ocean there. Uh, moving on to Austria, the, the Austrian government has determined that their best course of action is to repeat history quite accurately and quite significantly by sending out police officers to conduct random checks of medical passports of people going out in public on the street. 
Um, so yeah, I guess it really didn't go out of style uh, over time, uh, but this is part of a fresh wave of totalitarianism that has swept through Europe. And in Austria, in particular, every citizen has to be jabbed, even to be in a public place. Uh, otherwise, the informal but very real medical house arrest that most countries have adopted is really the only option for avoiding jail time or hefty fines in Austria. So um, there you go. Uh, you, it's quite poetic in a lot of ways how, um, uh, you know, they say that history repeats or at least rhymes, and I guess we're kind of finding out that that's quite true. Um, but moving on to Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, unfortunately, the war is back on again, um, as quite literally everyone expected. Uh, Azerbaijan started the war back uh, by shelling civilian cities in Armenia and uh, by capturing and torturing uh, Armenian border guards uh, and soldiers. So currently the fighting is not located in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, like last time. Uh, since Azerbaijan maintains control of that region, they kind of they kind of won the war, right? So they kind of kept it. Uh, Azerbaijan has done what literally everyone expected and has pushed further into Armenian territory um, to take as much land from Armenia as they can. Uh, our pretty easy softball assessment is that Azerbaijan is putting pressure on Armenia to concede even more territory to Azerbaijan and sort of hold the Nagorno-Karabakh region as a uh, hostage, uh, as a prize that um, Azerbaijan can be appeased with so that Azerbaijan doesn't invade the rest of Armenia, if that kind of makes sense. We all know how appeasement works out when it comes to the annexation of other countries, right? Uh, anybody who's read a history book knows that it doesn't work out super well. Uh, but by and large, we think, like many others, uh, that Azerbaijan will not stop fighting uh, until Armenia doesn't even exist anymore. So as far as how long that's going to take, or even if that will be possible, uh, nobody really knows. Moving on to Poland and Belarus, uh, pretty serious stuff going on between these two nations. Uh, this is definitely the hottest border crisis I've personally seen in a long time between a NATO member and a Russian proxy. Uh, in short, this border dispute originated by uh, Belarus, uh, acting almost certainly on Russia's orders, um, funneling in as many refugees from the Middle East as possible to the Polish border so that they can gain access to the Schengen Zone and NATO and the rest of Western Europe. Middle Eastern refugees have been a huge problem for a very long time in Europe, and Belarus is intentionally funneling through people to Poland and thus creating issues. Um, so tensions are pretty high. Uh, Poland actually threatened to invoke Article 4 of the NATO Charter, which is a huge freaking deal. Like, this is the article that states that an attack on one member state is an attack on all. So Poland even mentioning this threat publicly is sort of akin to casually suggesting a world war, uh, which is pretty much exactly what would happen if, this, if they went through with this threat. So this really hints at how serious of a problem this is. It's not just a simple border dispute. Poland is treating this as an attack on their sovereignty due to the direct support that Lukas, Lukashenko's uh, government is giving the refugees, um, such as giving them wire cutters and melee weapons to throw at, throw at or hurt the Polish border guards with. Um, and I also say refugees in heavy air quotes because a significant number of these people are really bad people, like ISIS militants and other degenerates that aren't exactly looking to escape to a better life. They're just really looking to harm as many people as possible. Um, so, again, when we slap that word refugee on a group of people, we think, oh, well, they're just trying to escape to a better life. It's a much, much different situation with the refugees in Europe. Let me just leave it at that and say that it's not as innocent as you think it is. And the Middle East as a whole, culturally, religiously, uh, socially, is very, very different than what most people think it actually is. Uh, you have to go there. You have to live that life. You have to experience what that culture is. Um, from a few different perspectives to kind of understand what a lot of these people are like. And specifically the ones that are coming up to the border in Poland are not super great people. So uh, I'll just leave it at that and say, yeah, this is a big issue that's going to ha that's probably going to spiral uh, down downward for a while. Hopefully not too bad, but you never know. And then finally, France. Um, speaking of immigration issues, uh, France has been dealing with a lot of immigration issues, um, just like everybody else in Europe. Um, 
but lately it's been exasperated and it really especially spicy uh, for France because November 13th was the anniversary of the Paris terror attacks uh, that killed 160 people six years ago. And this uh, also, <laughs> in conjunction with this, around the same time of this anniversary, um, there has been some collusion that came to light in which private companies were partnering with government agencies to discriminate against French citizens by hiring only refugees. So companies set up this racket where they would get cheap labor and the French government would have an excuse to bring in more refugees or have a place to put the refugees. Um, so, you know, obviously this is an oversimplification of the issue. Remember, needless complexity is a great way to conceal activities, so there's obviously more to it than this. Uh, but the point is, is that France, like the United States, is going to be dealing with immigration from the Middle East for a long time to come. So that's all I've got for today, everyone. Thank you all for watching, and thank you again to everyone who supports us out there. It really does uh, make a huge difference. So here are your slides for today. This is your slide one, slide two, slide three, and slide four. So as always, these slides can be found on our Odyssey page by using the links in the description, like I mentioned. And uh, you can find all that stuff there. And if you wanted to watch the video over on Odyssey, you can do that too. So... There you go. Hopefully this helps everyone. And again, thank you all for watching. And always remember, fight in the shade.